I think one of the things that is um, that Maureen actually asked me to do um, when she called and, and uh, about this presentation was she asked me can you can you give an overview of your research um, and can you also sort of tie in a bit of your personal history into it as well because uh, people might be interested to know where you came from and then I think also where this science is going in the future um, and the beginning and the end are fairly straightforward because I, I feel that um, you know talking about your research is actually fairly straightforward um, and talking about where you think the future is going is also you know fairly straightforward in some sense given given your knowledge of the subject but it made me think how on earth did I get here um, and I, I don't know how many of you sort of look at the metro and things like that when you're traveling or once you did travel or at the KLM magazine, these in-flight magazines and things, and you flip to the back and there's always a Sudoku puzzle back there, isn't there? There's a Sudoku puzzle and then there's a wretched labyrinth. There's a labyrinth puzzle. And that labyrinth, when you look at it, always looks a bit complicated and you think, hmm, how do I get through this? And I feel that's a bit like how I look forward at things. I don't really know how I get through it because you don't really know the path. But once you've actually done the labyrinth and you look back at your path and you think, well, that was actually quite straightforward. But the problem is, is that you don't know the solution at the beginning. In hindsight, you do know. Um, and when it comes to solving these labyrinths, really, the critical points are when you get to a junction, aren't they? The straight lines are fine. There's nowhere to go. But when you get to a junction, you need to make a decision. Do I turn left or do I turn right on this labyrinth problem? And in the labyrinth problem, you can sort of see the end goal. There's, a, there's the end point over here somewhere, and you think, well, maybe I should turn left, because that kind of leads me towards where I'm going. Um, and when Maureen asked me, you know, can you talk a little bit about your, your, how you got here, I thought, how on earth did I end up in Glasgow, starting from a small little farm in rural Canada? And when I mean rural Canada, I mean rural Canada. It takes me an hour and a half from my hometown to get to the next fuel station to fill up the car. So how on earth did that trajectory end up with me here? And I think when I look at this, when I look at sort of my, the, the labyrinth, and you look at your path, and you think, how did I make decisions at each one of those junctures? And I think, actually, those decisions were really made based on curiosity and a passion, I think. It wasn't that I made a decision about I'm aiming to get a lectureship at Glasgow and I'm aiming to work on wildebeest in the Serengeti ecosystem. That kind of happened. What I was really passionate about were ecosystems. I grew up in an area which we have in our farm, we have animals all over the place. We have bears that come in, we have wild turkeys, deer, elk, raccoons, all kinds of things. And for me, being in an ecosystem is really, really important. Because for me, it shows a little bit of, of where you came from. You are the product of this ecosystem. But also, your actions somehow have implications on that ecosystem. And so at every single one of the decisions that life came along with, I kind of made decisions based on what I really, really wanted to do. And for me, ecosystems are really the thing, right? I'm really concerned about ecosystems. We look at ecosystems around the world and we can see that they're collapsing at an unprecedented rate. I study the Serengeti wildebeest migration. And in this, in this image that I have up here, you can see um, you know, a fairly sizable herd of wildebeest. Now, kind of droning in a little bit on this image, one of the things I want you to notice on this image is that not only are we seeing wildebeest in the forefront, but if you look back on the horizon, you can also see some trees, right? And if you look further back, you see another line of trees going up the mountain. And on top of the mountain, there are some, actually some other trees as well. And in fact, the tops of those mountains are some of the oldest rocks on the planet. 3.5 billion years old, those rocks. Those rocks, when those rocks were formed, life on this planet was a biofilm it wasn't even cells around. And then through these epochs of time, we've had the whole proliferation of the plants, we've had the invertebrates that have taken over the, the seas, we've had the insects come out, we've had the dinosaurs come and go. But one thing that you don't see in this image that is the product of that evolution is a very, very delicate and balanced web of interactions, right? 
that is highly, highly evolved. So for example, those trees that you see in the background have to contend every year with a tsunami of fire that sweeps across this entire landscape and essentially obliterates all vegetation in that, in that landscape. How on earth do those trees survive? Well, I'll tell you, the wildebeest help them. The wildebeest help the trees. And the wildebeest help the trees because those wildebeest eat a lot of food. In fact, that image there is about 2,000 animals, okay? That's quite a lot. 2,000 animals, that's quite a lot of animals, right? There are 1.3 million wildebeest in this ecosystem. Now, that's a hard number to imagine. Can you imagine 1.3 million? You can't really, can you? But I tell you how to do it. One of the ways you can do it is if you imagine you have a penny for every wildebeest, okay? And I've got some pennies here. I have a penny for every wildebeest, and I'm going to take these pennies out, and I'm going to stack them, okay? One penny on top of the other. There's one. There's another. Oh. There is another, okay? And I take a penny for every wildebeest. 1.3 million pennies high. You know how high that is? It's higher than any building in Glasgow. How many people say it's higher than Ben Lomond, our nearest Monroe? Higher or lower? Higher? You say higher? Anybody say lower? It's higher. Oh, one lower, okay. It's higher than Ben Lomond. It's actually, um, well, let's just say, uh, what's an, let's take the tallest Monroe in UK, Ben Nevis. Higher than Ben Nevis? Why Ben Nevis is, what is Ben Nevis? It's something like 1.8 kilometers high, something like that, from sea level. Higher than Ben Nevis? Yep. It's almost another half a kilometer higher than Ben Nevis. That's a mountain of pennies that has to move every single day and find enough food. How do you feed a mountain of pennies, wildebeest? In fact, they eat 4, 4 4.5 million tons of grass every day. That's a huge amount of grass, and that tells you how much this ecosystem actually has to produce in order to have that biomass, okay? So in other words, we've got this incredible diversity of animals huge abundance of animals moving around this ecosystem. And what happens here is that these wildebeest are essentially eating everything that they can consume along their way. And by eating everything they can consume, they decrease the frequency of fires and allow those trees to survive. Okay? So these are really intricate balances that are going on in these systems. Right, okay, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about wildebeest in a little bit more I better take my pennies because I'm going to need them. So I'm going to keep those. Um, now we're going to talk a little bit more about what's actually happening with these animals. Okay, so each one of these animals, so, well, first of all, I'm an ecologist. So I study ecosystems and I study the distribution and abundance of, of organisms and what limits the distribution and abundance of organisms. Each one of these animals has to find enough food in order to survive, and it also has to find areas that it's not going to get eaten. Okay, it's trying to avoid getting predated itself. Now, um, as these animals are moving around this landscape, they're making decisions, right? Ultimately, uh, the decisions that they make about when and where to move determine their survival, okay? So one of the things that we're really interested in is how do these animals make decisions, okay? You can imagine that the animal make, might make a decision based on where the food's available, okay? So in other words, I know where the kitchen is, so, uh, I'll go and hang out in the kitchen because that's where the food is, all right? But you don't hang out in the kitchen every day, all day. Well, I mean, not usually, right? I mean, maybe sometimes you do. But you don't do it every day, all day. You only go to the kitchen when you're hungry. And so if we know where the, where the resources are, we're only seeing part of the picture. But what we don't know is what the animal's actually feeling, the physiology of that animal. And in fact, the other thing that you can see here is that the, the, the decision that Martha's making is probably a decision that the neighbor is making as well. In other words, they're heavily influenced by their social network. So in other words, we've got an additional layer of complexity here, and that is the physiology of the animal and the social structure. So how do we incorporate these things into our research? Okay, right, 
right, so I'm going to show you. Um, here is a, a map of the Serengeti. Um, and what you see in the top, that top little line, I don't know if, it, can I just move the mouse and you see the mouse? Is that, can you see that? Can you see that? Yeah, right, okay. That is the international boundary between Tanzania and Kenya, okay? So this is Kenya up here, this is Tanzania down here. Um, and the background that I have here is what's called an NDVI. It's a satellite image of how green the grass is, okay? So the greener the pixel, the greener the grass. That's the way I've colored it. And uh, the red areas are really dry areas. I mean, the orange areas are really dry areas, except for that big orange blob right there, which ironically is the exact opposite. That's Lake Victoria, okay? So ignore old Lake Victoria. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to play you a little animation of a wildebeest with a radio collar. These are GPS radio collars, and these GPS radio collars are a bit like a mobile phone, okay? What we do is we stick it onto the animal's neck, and we let it go for about two, three years and we watch to see where it's going and how it's getting along, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play you a little video animation of how this animal is moving. Okay, so we've released it um, at our study site. It's going up into Kenya in the dry season. You can see the progression of the dry happening here. Um, and as the ecosystem is getting wet, it starts migrating down about 250 kilometers south, okay? Around in these areas here, it's actually dropping its calves. They all drop their calves about the same time every year. And then as the ecosystem dries, they, she and her calf will migrate back up into the north, uh, into this dry season refuge, and then come all the way back down again as the, uh, with the progression of the wet season, okay? So we have this flood of animals going up and down based on rainfall. And it's the same thing that happens with birds, for example, here. This flood of birds coming up into Europe to actually consume insects. We, we like to think of birds like cuckoos and things like that as typically British European birds. They're not. These are African birds that visit Europe for a very short period of time, but they live in Africa, okay? These are African birds that spend most of their time there and then come to the UK just to eat all the insects and things like that that come up with spring, okay? And that's what these animals are doing here is that they're following a gradient of resources going back and forth. Okay, so how do we how do we analyze this data? How do we actually get something out of this? What, what does being an ecologist actually mean? How do you sort of turn this into a science? Putting a glorified mobile phone onto an animal's neck doesn't sound like science to me. It's the beginning of it, but it doesn't really tell us very much. Okay. Oh, sorry. If we look at every single one of these points, so I've taken that entire track log of that animal's movement, and I look at each section of points. Now, if I take three points together, right, I can define a couple of things here. I can define the angle at which it turns, okay, and I can define the distance between consecutive points, right? And if I define the turn angle and the distance, I can differentiate different types of behaviors, can't I? Because I can differentiate a behavior that looks a little bit like this, you see? an animal lingering in an area. So it's stopped in an area and it's eating something perhaps, or it's doing something in that area. And I can differentiate that type of behavior from this type of behavior here, where this animal, oops, you see that? Where this animal has suddenly decided, you know what, there's something I really, really do not like about this environment, and I'm gonna move, okay? now. I am anthropomorphizing that. I'm saying that they don't like something there. But it could be that rather than I don't like something there, it's something much better over there. So I'm getting pulled rather than pushed, okay? Okay, so if we look at some of these, um, well, well, actually, one before I get to that step, at every single one of those points, you can measure different aspects of that environment, okay? So at every single point, I can ask, what's the quality of the grass here? How good is that grass? Are you, are you sitting, for example, on an ice cream patch, right? Or are you sitting on a, a patch of potatoes, you know? Um, and uh, the next point, are you sitting close to where a lion might like to be? Or are you sitting out in the lovely green grass plains where the, you can see predators for miles, okay? So you can start measuring landscape variables that relate to how good the food is, the availability of that food, and also the risk, right? 
So in other words, you're trying to capture this balance that these animals are facing between the resources and the risks. Okay, now I'm going to show you a couple of results. Oh, shoot, I keep on going the wrong way. Okay, so this might look a bit intimidating, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain the axes first, the x-axis and the y-axis. So the x-axis is the one on the bottom, and the y-axis is the one on the, on the upright. And if we look, um, if we, sorry, five screens, four screens, I don't know which one to choose. This is crazy. Okay, if we look at, for example, the x-axis here, this is the distance you are from a grass nitrogen patch, for example, as opposed to uh, a patch of high grass biomass, right? And the y-axis is how far you move between sequential points, right, when you're in one of those patches, okay? So, for example, we can look to see, let me just point out this one here, the grass biomass. When an animal is right next to, so the distance to grass biomass, so when you're right next to a grass biomass patch, you move about three kilometers uh, a, a day, okay? So high grass biomass. When you're a long way from a high grass biomass patch, you kind of do the same thing. So what we're seeing here is the black line is the mean and the dotted lines are, are the, the spread of the variance, okay? So you can't really tell what's going on here. However, when I look at something like distance to humans, so you imagine every single one of those points and you say, how far away are you from a human settlement. And humans in this ecosystem is a bit of a threat. Humans, humans consume about 100,000 wildebeest every year, illegally. 100,000 wildebeest every year, illegally, on little wire snares. That's a huge offtake coming off this population. What we find is that when animals are really close to humans, they tend to move more every day. In other words, they kind of want to get out of there, right? You just keep on moving. Just Leave it behind, right? You want to get away from it. And that's what we're seeing. But now look at this one. This is grass nitrogen. Animals love grass nitrogen. That means protein, okay? That's the ice cream patch. And what we find is something really strange. We end up with a pattern that looks almost identical to the humans, okay? The other crazy thing that we're seeing here is look at what's happening with predation. We're seeing almost no pattern happening with predation. This is telling us that Wildebeest don't give a fig about the lions. Is that true? I, I, I don't think so. I've seen wildebeest running from lions for their lives. I don't, I don't believe that. What's going on, right? And why, why do I end up with the same sort of behavior when you're sitting on an ice cream patch as to when you're scared, okay? So imagine, imagine you're at home, right? Imagine you're at home. Um, and you are sitting comfortably on your sofa, you turn on Netflix, it's loading up. You remember that little arrow thing that goes around and around? You get to 90% and you think, shoot, I'm going to run to the kitchen and get a bag of chips because I want to get a bag of chips before this movie starts. And you run to the kitchen in the last 10% and you run back to the sofa, right? That's a fast run. Now imagine you're sitting on the sofa watching Netflix and suddenly the front door smashes open and a thief is coming in. You might run out the back door, or you might run for cover, right? The problem is, if I had, if I was watching your mobile phone, so your radio caller, your behavior would be almost identical. You're running fast. But I have no idea if you're running fast because you're scared or because you're hungry, okay? And so the big challenge comes to say, what is, how do we capture animal perception or motivation here? So this is some work that we've been doing in the last um, few years here in Glasgow, actually. Um, when you look across this landscape, what I've shown you is a, a gradient of rainfall of NDVI, okay, that, that, that grass gradient. But in actual fact, there's all kinds of other things that change across this landscape as these animals are moving. So as you can see down here in the south, these are vast plains that look like a giant golf course. You can see for miles. You can see a lion coming, you know, five kilometers away. Okay, but if you look at the image up at the top, can you see the lion in that image? Have a look. Can you see the lion in that, that image in the top? You can't see it, can you? In fact, I'm not even too sure it's there. And that's the problem, is that you cannot see what's actually happening. So the, the risk of predation is changing across this landscape. And ideally, what I want to know is at each one of those points, is the animal scared, right? Is it hungry? 
Is it pregnant? What's its salt water balance doing? Does it have enough water? Right? It's a bit like, it's a bit like you know, your weekly phone call home and your mother's asking you, are you all right? Are you getting enough to eat? Are you, no, it's, it's, that's exactly what I want to know. I want to have a weekly phone call with every single one of my wildebeest to ask them, how are you getting on? But how do I do that when I can't talk to a wildebeest? Okay. One of the things that we've been doing is um, doing quite a lot of post-mortems on wildebeest. Wildebeest are always seen to be killed on TV, right? Every time you see a wildebeest, it's getting eaten by a crocodile, it's getting eaten by a lion, it's getting eaten by a hyena, it's getting eaten by a cheetah, it's, you know, all these things. Wildebeest are seen to be dropping dead all the time. You always see them dropping dead. And so we ask the question, what do you die from? And it turns out the vast majority of wildebeest don't die from being eaten, they die from starvation. Most wildebeest die from just straight up starvation, okay? When an animal is starving, at least a wildebeest starving, um, the way to tell whether it's starving is once it's dead, you crack open its femur, okay? Now, when an animal is going through starvation, what happens is that it mobilizes all the fat stores, all the subcutaneous fat, all the visceral fat, uh, all that kind of stuff. It then starts catabolizing its own proteins, its own muscles. The last store of fat is actually the bone marrow. Once you've used up your bone marrow fat, you're a goner. Your tanks are empty. You cannot even stand up. You're basically a carcass with a pulse, okay? And so what we do is we go along and we look at every single animal, we crack open its femur, and we estimate how many of these animals are actually dying of starvation, how many are dying from predation, how many are, are otherwise healthy. And while we're doing that, uh, so, we, well, actually, there's quite a lot of animals that are dying across this ecosystem. So sometimes you can tell why an animal died, okay? Like in this situation, you've got a very suspicious-looking hyena in the background. You've got a very full-looking lion in the foreground. Don't know who killed it, but there's some pretty good evidence going on here, okay? So the who done it here is pretty, pretty clear. Um, the other thing is, is that you can tell from the way that the carcass is dismembered as to who's, who's been doing it, but we won't get into that because each predator dismembers a carcass in a very different way. Sometimes you come across a carcass like this one, right? This is just a dead animal in the middle of nowhere. And your whodunit, you have no idea. Is that disease? Is it anthrax? Is it, did it trip over a, over a stone and knock itself out? I mean, what happened, okay? We have no idea what's actually going on, okay? So what we do is every single one of these carcasses, we chop them up, and we have a look to see all kinds of things. So those are flies, by the way. It can be a fairly smelly, fairly smelly operation. You'd be happy to note that I'm not wearing any of those clothes. Those are all my field clothes. I'm not wearing them today or anything like that. Um, but uh, those, are, and, and again, I mean, when we're talking about ecosystems, you can see what a feast this is for all those flies. You chop these things up and you determine what's been going on. When you're chopping it up, we also collect tail hair. Now, tail hair is really important we're discovering. As hair is growing, even my hair, your hair, as hair is growing, it's incorporating all kinds of metabolites that are circulating in your bloodstream continuously into the hair as it's growing. It's a bit like a tree ring. If you pull a hair, it's like pulling out, it's like doing a tree cord and finding out what's actually happening, okay? So by cutting up the hair, you can look at the various metabolites along the way. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about isotopes, okay? There is an isotope called a nitrogen isotope, okay? Isotopes um, are essentially different formations of elements with extra little protons. Actually, they're extra neutrons, not protons. But the heavier forms of, of, of these isotopes take longer for an animal to process, okay? So by looking at the isotope ratio, you can determine whether an animal is a herbivore, a predator, primary consumer, tertiary consumer, things like that, okay? Because it depends on how they're processing the nitrogen. The faster, when you're processing nitrogen, what happens is that the heavier ones stay behind a little bit, okay? Imagine, imagine a, a river full of stones. All the heavy stones stay at the top. All the light stones go, okay? And so that's what's happening with these nitrogen elements. Now, typically, nitrogen gets enriched with a predator, okay? But what we're seeing in tail hair is that nitrogen is actually getting enriched as the animal starves, 
Because what's happening is that you're mobilizing your own fat stores. You're essentially eating yourself. And so now we might have an index of how an animal might be starving over time. So here's a little experiment we did. We had a look to see at um, starved animals. These are ones that died of starvation with this thin, soupy bone marrow. And these are non-starved animals, very hat, fat, healthy animals. And what we can see is that the ones with, that have starved have this enriched nitrogen signature, okay? So in other words, this is an indicator in the tail hair of something to do with the, 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 how well the animal is doing. In other words, it's, it's, um, it's proximity to starvation. Okay, so now if I chop up that hair over the entire sequence, what I can do is, um, is I can look to see how starvation changes over time, okay? On the x-axis here, this is time, this is year. This is, sorry, this is day, Julian day, so zero to 360. And what we see is that this huge starvation peak going on right around in here. What do you think is the most expensive thing a wildebeest does? Being pregnant, do you think that's expensive? Potentially. Do you think running away from predators is expensive? Probably. The most expensive thing that any mammal does is produce milk. Lactation is the most expensive thing because essentially that is pure fat. You're mobilizing pure fat and you're giving it away. Okay? And what we're seeing here is right after they drop their calves, they go into this huge starvation peak. They're pouring out energy into their calves. Okay? And it's not until the calves actually wean that they start gaining fat again. Okay? So you're storing all this fat and then you're pouring it into your offspring. Okay? The whole purpose of eating all the way through that entire other period is to get enough fat so that you can raise your babies. You can raise a fat baby. Right? That's what's called capital breeding. In other words, you don't just use the resources that are available at the time. You store them up and then you dump them all into your big fat baby. Okay? Right. I'm going to change gear here a little bit. Talk about, about um, some sort of self-experimentations and things like this. Because these guys really inspired me. So there's a guy called John Stapp. These are sort of some reasons why I'm so enthusiastic about research, because I, I find inspiration from people like this. John Stapp, he tested the limits of human deceleration. <laughs> you know how he did this? He created a thing called a rocket sled. I, I'm not kidding you. It's a little sled that he has on a track, or had on a track, and he would propel himself into the wall, right? To test what happened with a human body when, when it decelerated. <laughs> Now, you can imagine what the outcome of that might be. Concussion, yep, he did that. He broke his wrists. He, uh, he broke ribs. He, um, he, he decelerated so quickly that he knocked the fillings out of his teeth. He detached his retinas. He did it something like 70 times with himself, self-experimenting with himself, measuring different things every single time. But during this process, he was testing other things to try and slow that impact down. What happens to the human body when it decelerates and can I try and change that in some way? If you've ever been in a car crash, you probably owe your life to this guy because he developed the seat belts, the three-point seat belt, which we have in every single car right now. That's the product of John Stapp. But through huge, huge self-sacrifice, of course. Now, I'm sure John Stapp was, uh, was very grateful for this other self-experimenter. This is Humphrey Davy. Humphrey Davy is a Cornish uh, chemist, and he, uh, he was actually, um, he, dis he was one of the first people to isolate things like magnesium and sodium and things like this. But the other thing he discovered is nitrous oxide, and in fact, he inhaled nitrous oxide. God knows why he would inhale nitrous oxide, and found that he could not stop laughing, okay? He just broke down into hysterics every time he inhaled, inhaled nitrous oxide. And that was the foundation of anesthetics. So I'm sure John Stapp was pretty happy about Humphrey Davy's experiments. Here's another one. Here's Nicholas Sen. This is a little bit more off the beaten track. Nicholas Sen was, uh, was an American um, army surgeon, and he was really interested in uh, the gastrointestinal tract and perforations to the gastrointestinal tract and how that, 
uh, you know, how he could detect these things. And the way that he designed an experiment to try and figure this out, I'm not kidding you, he had a balloon full of hydrogen gas. Why hydrogen gas? I have no idea, because that sounds very explosive to me. And a rubber hose. And he up his anus and gently, with the help of an assistant, inflated his gastrointestinal tract with hydrogen gas to detect perforations. And, his, and this, was, this was how it was done. And during that experiment, he was able to find out huge amounts of things, well, these repeated experiments, he was able to find out a huge amount of things about how the gastrointestinal tract worked. Okay, so I was looking at these guys thinking, my God, this whole hair experiment, if I'm serious about this hair experiment, I've got to do some self-experiments, right? I'm going to have to find a wall or, a, or, or something, right? So what I did is I convinced um, uh, my PhD student, Callum Buchanan, to shave my head. <laughs> um, and this was before Callum actually defended his PhD, so he was a little bit nervous about it, as one could imagine. I asked him, okay, Callum, let's, let's shave my head and let's just measure the cortisol in my hair as if it was a wildebeest's hair. And then what I'm going to do is that I'm going to compare it to my Google Calendar. Okay? So here is my cortisol over time. Here is my cortisol level over time. This is uh, from August 2018 all the way through, through Christmas uh, and into uh, January 2019. So about a year ago, or yeah, maybe a bit more, two years. Um, and then I looked at my Google Calendar to find out what, what on earth is going on during these times. Why does my cortisol level change so wildly over time? And what I found is that peak right there coincides with a European Research Council grant application. These are huge applications. They're incredibly stressful. Perhaps one of the most stressful things I've done in my academic career was putting together and going for interview for this very large European Union Council grant, Research Council grant. You can also see Christmas as well, when we went on holiday. So this kind of convinced me, thinking, well, if I can do that in myself, what happens if I try and do it in a wildebeest, right? Now I can ask them, are you stressed? What happens when you get to those thick patches where you can't see the lion? Do you feel a little bit anxious, right? So you've got a perfect sort of phone call experiment. This is, you know, your mother phoning you up. That's what I want. So go back out to the field. We radio collar a bunch more wildebeest. That's a wildebeest here, obviously. And every time we radio collar a wildebeest, we cut its tail hair, half of its tail hair, okay? Um, here's Joseph Masoy and Majaliwa Masolele, two field assistants. In fact, Majaliwa just finished his, P his master's thesis here in Glasgow, actually. Um, Tom Morrison, who's continuing to work with us as well. Um, so we let this animal go. We let it go, do its full migration all year round, and then we capture it again. And then you take that hair that's regrown and you take that back to the lab and you find out what's been going on in this animal's life. Because now you know where it's been, right, from the GPS data, and you also have at least a little bit of an indicator as to some sort of physiological response of that animal over time. Okay. So this is the same animal. There's Callum and Kim as well, two PhD students. This is the same animal, but just measuring different things over time. So we can see from going from July to July, so a full year, um, and what we have here is cortisol. Cortisol is a metric or, or a metabolite that's associated with stress in animals. That was what I measured in my own hair, was cortisol. So we can see cortisol in time or as the animal's moving, and we can also see that starvation index over time, okay? January, January, February sort of time, when they drop their calves, everything goes haywire. You see that big, big spike in, in that lactation spike, pushing out all your energy into that, but you can also see the stress is going all over the place. All right, so it becomes very unstable. Now this is interesting because what we can also do is we can then ask how does that change in time and in space? Okay, so here's our map of the Serengeti again, and we can ask, okay, are there locations on the left-hand side where an animal is going through positive and negative energy balance? Okay, what you can see is down here, look at this. this is, these are the locations where the animal is probably starving the most. And yet the irony is, is that those are the locations where there is the richest grass. That's where the grass is the best. You can't get better than that. 
It's the ice cream patch, okay? And yet these animals are starving. What that's telling me is that they are essentially eating as much as they can and using all the fat that they've saved up all year long to dump into their calves, because that's where they give birth to their calves. That's the exact spot they give birth to their calves. And that's why it's so important that they cash in on that really rich grass, okay? They have to get that rich grass. If they miss that rich grass, there's no way that they can actually support a calf, okay? Because you need lots of fat and you need lots of your own, you need lots of your own fat and you need lots of high nutrients grass to get food. Okay, cortisol, on the other hand, you can see uh, goes up all the way up into the north. So now we can start looking at bottlenecks and things like that. So we could combine all these things into what we call these sort of Markovian process models. And um, I'm just going to glance over this fairly quickly. But uh, what, one thing I do want to show you is when you look at those types of movement, you can differentiate into a couple of different um, what we call behavioral types. So what we would call like that encamped phase. In other words, an animal is choosing to stay in an area. You remember the, those trajectories. An animal chooses to stay in an area as opposed to an animal who chooses to leave. Okay? Um, and we can differentiate those types of movement. Um, what we're looking at on the top is how far an animal is going. So in other words, the, the distance that it's moving. And you can see when it's encamped, it's moving a very short distance every day. And when it's migratory, it's moving a long distance every day, which makes sense. This is the turn angle. So from negative pi to pi, okay? So when it's zero, it's walking in a straight line, okay? Pi is exactly opposite. And I can get to pi by going left or I can get to pi by going right. Sorry, I did that the wrong way. That's right, left, yeah. Um, so you can, get to, you, can get, you can turn on either way. But what you see is that the encamped phase, you tend to move any direction randomly. Okay, so your turn angle is a meander like this. You're just meandering around. And in a migratory phase, you're moving forward. Now what you can do is you can relate every single one of those other covariates, other one of those environmental variables, and say which one is determining whether this animal chooses to stay or leave. Okay? So nitrogen looks like basically... Um, what you can see here, uh, it might be easier to look at this. What you can see here is this is um, looking at, let me just look at this figure here, okay? This is the probability um, of an animal that is encamped switching to become a migrant as a function of the grass nitrogen, okay? So when the grass nitrogen is really high, if you're encamped, chances are you have a very low probability of switching to migration, okay? So in other words, you stay encamped. When an animal is actually in a very high grass nitrogen, or a very low grass nitrogen place, and it's encamped, it has a very high probability of switching to become a migrant. So in other words, you know what? I'm in a pretty crappy place right now. The food isn't very good here. There's a very high chance that I leave. You can do the same thing with all the, with all the stress hormones and things like that. And look at that. Almost no response at all. So what I've done is I've done all these experiments. I've shown you that these things vary over time and vary over space. But the problem is, this is the cutting edge. We are now at the coal face of where the science is, okay? And sure, it might not sound all that exciting, but I can tell you, this negative result is the next challenge, right? This is, this is our next challenge in trying to understand how do we understand, how do we integrate that physiological response that we're getting from the tail hair that I can get from each one of your own hairs how do I integrate that into your decision-making process? Okay. Right. That's physiology. The other thing is social structure might have something to do with it. What I've got here um, is a drone image. We fly drones over these herds as well. Okay. Now, you can imagine if you're in a, in a big herd like this, um, you want to cross that river, but you have no idea how to cross it. And in fact, what's actually happening is that somebody else has made a decision and you're learning from that decision, okay? So in this video, what you're seeing is every single animal is making, is making a choice, right? Every single animal is trying to cross that river at that point right there, but these animals back here have no idea what's actually happening. In fact, they haven't even seen that river, 
okay? But they're gleaning information about this landscape simply by social interaction, okay? And in fact, what you're not seeing here is that there's actually a group of lions right over here as well. So they're actually, you can see other animals joining in, coming in, and funneling down through and then crossing this river here, okay? Now there's a hundred, there's a million, there's an infinite number of places to cross that river, right? Why there? Who made the choice to cross there? Who is the leader? Is there a leader, right? This kind of relates a little bit to how we run democracies. Is this really a collective decision? Is this really a collective decision? Do you think every single one of those will to be sits and votes? Yeah, I'll take, I'll take Ben number three, please. No way. No way. There's somehow, there's a leadership game happening here. We don't know who it is, but somehow there's a leadership game happening here. Potentially animals that are experienced, more experienced and less experienced. So what I've shown you is a video. Obviously, videos, turning videos into data is really hard. If you're interested in collective behavior, this is the guy to work with, Colin Torney. He's in the maths department. He's a specialist in collective behavior, works here at the University of Glasgow, does things on swarms of fish, um, flocks of birds, and incidentally, herds of wildebeest, thank goodness, because that's really where the money's at, right? That's really what we're interested in is wildebeest. Okay. So what he does is that he uses these machine learning algorithms to actually turn every single wildebeest into a dot. So now you can follow, for example, I don't know, let's follow 228 right up there. Um, and you can follow that animal. Where is she? She's gone. Well, we'll follow somebody else. How about number 45? 45 is not doing anything much. Uh, okay, 45 is being a bit hesitant. Now you see 45 has gone in with a cluster. Oh, interesting. Okay, so it's joined in with a group. And you can follow 45 in relation to every single other animal. So you can ask, how close is 45 to every other animal? And who is it that's instigating 45 to move? Or is it 45 the one instigating somebody else to move? Okay. And that allows us to build these types of um, uh, images, which are basically showing us um, patterns of how animals are actually moving through this landscape. So this is the nearest neighbor. What this is showing us is that in that image, um, the nearest neighbor tends to be in front or behind. So in other words, high values tend to be in front and behind the focal animal. Okay? Um, and this is a variance of heading. So in other words, animals that are in front of you tend to be heading the same way as you are. Animals that are behind you tend to be in the same heading as you are. And animals off to the side tend to be opposite or varying. Okay? So you can now measure these types of mat metrics on all kinds of different scenarios. Maybe they're crossing a river. Maybe they're crossing a road. Maybe they're uh, avoiding a human uh, interaction. Maybe they're doing, uh, they're just grazing, right? And so we're able to try and disentangle these social, these social interactions. Okay, so I'm going to wrap it up there. If you want to get daily updates of wildebeest and zebra and a giant gazelle called an eland, the world's biggest gazelle, it's bigger than a cow, actually, um, uh, we have these animals collared. You can get updates on this website here, which is our public website. Um, and what it does is it shows you and it gives you animations of where the animals are actually moving. So this is actually as of this morning. So that's where all the animals are as of this morning. Um, and in fact, if you're really keen, you can download that as an app on your phone, which I'm sure you'd love to do. Okay, so thanks very much. Um, and I will be very happy to take any questions about this or about careers or anything else. So thank you. Thank you very much, Grant. Yeah, that was fabulous. Um, do we have any questions from the audience, first of all? Could you just shout your question out and then Grant will repeat it? Sure, yeah. Yeah, so I'm just going to repeat your question so that you can hear it over, uh, over the web. So the question is, the question is um, do we have any information on where lions are occurring and how wildebeest are, are, re are reacting to where those lions are in real time? And or does that influence cortisol? Um, so uh, we don't actually have radio collars on lions. But what we do have is 
um, we've got a long record of, um, of locations where lions have been making kills. And so what we can do then is we can ask, right, how do, how do lions make kills? Is it random or do they make kills in specific areas? And what it turns out is lions are really, really good at making kills, but only in certain places, right? For a lion to make a kill, they need to be about 15 meters from their prey. So even less from me to you, okay? Beyond that distance, they can't, they can't do it because they can, they can accelerate, but they can't run for very fast. So they need all kinds of bits of cover. Um, and so what we do then is we can then, if we understand how lions are making kills, we can then measure the landscape and say, what, what is the predation risk from a lion's perspective here? And that's, what, that's exactly what we do. What you see when it comes to cortisol, actually, so you can then look to see, does cortisol relate to where, you know, how risky that landscape is? Turns out that, uh, this is Callum's work, actually, Callum, Callum Buchanan's uh, PhD work. Turns out that what actually is a big predictor of that is not necessarily where the lions are, but where the humans are. Humans actually have a much bigger effect on the cortisol than, than lions do, and we think that, that that lack of relationship between predation and cortisol and predation and, and movement is because these animals, when they're moving, they're moving with 300,000 other animals, okay? And if there's a pride of lions in an area, there's six, seven maybe in a pride, right? That means they're going to kill one <laughs> every day, two days. And so it's this matter of dilution. You know, you're moving through in a huge group, and so really... I think the effect that we're seeing of the predation is nowhere nearly as, a, as evident as the effect we're seeing of humans because humans in the area and the whole herd is, uh, is mobilized. Yeah. Good question. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Just a follow-up question for this one, actually. Is there an estimation of how many kills are made by lions as compared to the 100,000 that are killed by humans? Yeah, um, so the question is, is how many, how many uh, uh, are killed by predators, lions, as opposed to humans? So humans, the human count is between 60 and 100,000 uh, animals, wildebeest, killed every, every year. Um, with, uh, with the lions, it's probably in the neighborhood of, well, so there's about, there's about 2,000 lions in the Serengeti, uh, and they eat about every second day. So if you assume that they eat a wildebeest every second day, um, then it comes to something like, I can't really remember the calculation off the top of my head, but it's something about 10,000. So uh, a, a much smaller percentage uh, that are actually being, and that's if you assume that a lion only eats a wildebeest. <laughs> of course, they're eating zebra and, and, and hartebeest and warthog and all kinds of other things. Um, but it's, it's almost insignificant. Um, and in fact, all the evidence suggests that, that the wildebeest population uh, is not at all regulated by the lion population. So in other words, lions have no hope of pushing down the wildebeest population. They just can't do it. There's just not enough of them. And in fact, the thing that regulates lions is actually other lions, interestingly. It's not the amount of food they can get, it's what their neighbors are doing. The number one cause of mortality in a lion is actually another lion. So they're really, really territorial and they kill each other all the time. Uh, and that, that sort of self-regulation by behavior actually regulates the lions. It means that they can never regulate the, the herbivores. Yeah. Yeah? Um, have you noticed a significant influence of climate change? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so one of the things that we've been doing, so we've been radio collaring wildebeest. So, so let me repeat the question. Uh, the question is, uh, is there an influence of climate change on the research? Um, and that's a really good question. One of the things we've been doing uh, is to look at the entire record of GPS collaring from wildebeest. So we first started putting wildebeest collars, GPS collars on wildebeest in 1999. So that gives us 20 years of radio collaring wildebeest, which is a really good stretch of time because then you can ask, how are these animals changing in relation to shifts in climate? We can definitely detect shifts in climate in terms of um, in terms of the seasonality. So what we're seeing in climate change is um, wetter dry seasons and drier wet seasons. So the seasons in, in East Africa are not summer and winter we have here. That's determined by rainfall. And what we're seeing is this sort of merging of the rains. Okay, so a less distinct pattern of dry and wet. They're kind of merging in together. That means that wildebeest are having a really hard time to track where you should be, right? 
Because if you know every February I need to be over here and suddenly that changes, it becomes really difficult. So what we have observed is that, first of all, two things. One is that um, we have some individuals who have actually done the migration twice in one year. <laughs> right? They do the whole thing two, two times over. So, and that entire migration is about 2,500 kilometers. Right? So that means a 5,000 5, kilometer round trip that you've got to do. The other thing we can do is we can ask, has there been variation in how they've moved over time? And there's a very clear pattern happening there. There's a very clear pattern. So the way that they moved in the period of 1999 to 2009 is very different from the way that they're moving 2009 to 2019, basically. Um, and there's uh, what we think is actually happening. So we're discerning that right now. We're actually working on that analysis right now. We're involving climate, but the other thing we're involving is tourism, the effect of mass tourism. Um, and what it's looking like is that we're ending up with two things happening in this system that's changing. One is this influx of humans coming in on the boundaries, pushing the wildebeest in. So these are cattle herders and things like that. And then this effect of mass tourism that's pushing wildebeest out of their prime areas, simply because there's so much tourists happening in these areas. And they're getting squeezed into this little sort of donut shape that is between, between the border of the national park and these prime tourism areas. Um, and what it's looking like is that, that climate has, a, has an effect on that, but it's getting swamped, again, by this human effect. Um, and, that's, and that's pretty concerning. Um, other than the fact that we can change how humans interact with the system, that is something that we can change. Not, not, not we ourselves, but managers can. Yeah. Question in the back. Mm, yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So the question is, um, uh, when we are putting on GPS collars on animals, how frequently are those fixes? In other words, the GPS locations between, um, um, uh, between points. So um, what we do is the, the collars, um, you want the collar to run for about two years. So you've got to tune it right back down. So we could end up with, for example, these collars are capable of sending you a location every minute if you want. But what we do is we tune it right back so we get four fixes a day, about every six hours. So dawn and dusk, so where are you when the sun comes up, where are you when the sun goes down, and where are you at midnight, and where are you at midday? Okay, so it gives you kind of four points. So you don't really know where they are in between, but you do know that they're at this point and at that point, at basically 6 a.m. and noon. Um, and so that's kind of our, what we'd call our step length, our our our, our, our our fundamental unit. It does get a bit complicated when you put these types of collars on like, like animals like whales and seals, for example, uh, because what ends up happening there is that, is that they only send locations when they're on the surface. Okay? And so when you do these types of studies in marine mammals, what ends up happening is that an animal disappears for a point of time, holds its breath. You have no idea what's happening underneath, under the, under the water, and then it pops up somewhere else. Okay? There's some really interesting research actually getting done at Swansea and also St. Andrews where they're putting on accelerometers onto these animals. And so by looking at, you know, like the accelerometer you have on your phone where it detects whether or not you're turning or, or your jogging speed or, or things like that, you put the same sort of device on and you can tell then what the marine mammal is doing under the water, uh, which, is really, which is really interesting. So, um, yeah, but I think for, for us, we can, uh, we just, we're just using a six, a six um, six hour intervals um, and uh, the next step of this research is actually to put on um, these accelerometers but also sound recorders um, and potentially video cameras. If you put on a video it takes a huge amount of battery life but it does tell you all kinds of things. It tells you how many people are around or how many wildebeest are around. Right? What's your environment? It tells you all kinds of other things. So that's sort of the next, the next phase of the, of the research. Yeah. Sorry, we have... We... Question. No, no. Yeah, 
so the question is, is why, why do the Serengeti wildebeest migrate when they don't migrate in other, other areas? Uh, same species, but don't migrate. Um, it, that's a good question. The, um, it's, it's one of the things with migration, there's a few things, is that when an animal population gets to be quite large, right, it escapes sort of the limits of predation like we were talking about. When an animal population gets to be quite large, one of the things that happens is that they eat all the food that's available to them in that one spot. And so they're forced to actually move. And by moving, actually, they can then become even, even more abundant, okay, because they're, they're actually accessing more resources. Now, you can't, become res you can't have that abundance and stay resident because you just run out of resources. Um, and so the only places you can migrate are really places where you have a gradient of resources up and down which you can migrate. Okay, so if the landscape is completely homogenous, right, it's the same everywhere, then it's very, it's very difficult to get these migrations, proper migrations happening. What they end up doing is home ranging. They'll go over here for a while, eat here, eat there, right, and come back and just sort of home range. But they won't do a proper annual migration. And that migration is really driven by the seasonal flux of resources. Um, Kruger is an interesting example because the wildebeest in Kruger actually did migrate at one point. And in fact, they no longer migrate because of a fence. We see the same thing across southern Africa, huge migrations that have been lost because of fencing and land use changes. And in fact, um, one of the things that's really concerning is, is that we're seeing basically a catastrophic collapse of migrations all around the world. Um, we did an audit of, of ungulate migrations, 28 different ungulates that migrate all around the world. Serengeti is the only place left in the world where the population is actually stable and not declining. Right? So it's, it's, it's a treasure, but it's also an indication of how these systems actually work in their truest form and what we've potentially lost in other systems. The migrations that used to happen in Europe, for example, gone. Uh, the migrations of bison in North America, gone. Um, there's a few migrations left in North America, like the caribou migration, the pronghorn, um, a few others, but most of them are collapsing at a, at a, at a huge rate. Yeah, so it's really concerning. <laughs>